The Old Testament reading is 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning with the first verse. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little maid from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my lord were with a prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, my father, if the prophet had commanded you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much rather than when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. This is the word of God for the people of God. Well, it's only fair to warn you at the outset that um, often on this Sunday closest to July 4th, I, uh, I tend to sink into a bit of a uh, grumpy mood. Some of it's the ennui of just uh, church attendance in the summer period, you know, like, uh, like we're here, but then a lot of people aren't here. And the myth, by the way, this just gets on my nerves, the myth is that everybody's out of town. But I know that this is not so. Many Sundays after church, I'll see somebody at lunch or somebody on the street. And sometimes they realize that I noticed they were absent. And they'll say very helpful things to me. Like a couple weeks ago, someone said, We got up this morning and we decided we would just stay on the porch and drink our coffee. Thank you <laughs> for that. Two Saturday nights ago, Lisa and I went to see Ira Glass down at Blumenthal. We're coming out of Blumenthal. We see a couple from the church. The guy says to me, well, as you can tell, I won't be at church tomorrow. <laughs> but then the Sunday closest to July 4th. Now, this just gets on my nerves because I know all these Americans who love to talk about freedom of religion. Soldiers die so that we can have freedom of religion. As best I can tell, we use that freedom of religion not to come to church. It's the lowest attendance Sunday of the entire year. You'd think if we treasured that freedom of religion, it would be the highest Sunday of the year. I'm just on a little rant. This, uh, the whole July 4th thing also gets on my nerves because we just get these little, con I'm just, I'll be done in a minute. Just let me get to work this out of my system. Because you're here, you get extra credit for coming today, so you're good. So, so July 4th, I have a cousin, she has already posted on Facebook, July 4th is when we remember soldiers who died for their country. That's Memorial Day. <laughs> on Memorial Day, she posted, this is the day we remember soldiers who served in the military. And I said, no, that's Veterans Day. <laughs> it's just so hard. And then we get mixed up anyway, because we talk about freedom. I don't know why this just so bothers me. People say, soldiers died for our freedom. And so what do we do to commemorate that? We drink beer, we eat hot dogs, and we shoot off fireworks. This just seems dumb to me. If it's something that's noble, we should do something noble. So a number of years ago, when my children were little, I decided, because we always get together, the extended family, all the cousins, everyone's together, I decided that uh, we shall do what families used to do in the 1800s. We shall have a reading of the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> 
So I would gather the family together, and you can just imagine, you know, the, my little nieces would be rolling their eyes. My poor children were really humiliated because it's their dad insisting on the reading. And I would read, and they would yawn, and people would go to the bathroom. And so after a number of years, I decided I'm going to just not do it this year and see if anybody asks. No one has asked <laughs> for the return of this. July 4th, for my money, there's really nothing more precious about it than what happened in 1826. Adams and Jefferson, I mean, fierce political rivals, I mean, they loathed one another. Abigail Adams even got in on the act, right? She, she said that my husband is an oak and Jefferson is a willow. <laughs> like, that's pretty good. But uh, after they both were out of office, uh, Adams wrote Jefferson a letter and I said, I, I think we should explain ourselves to one another before we die. So they began a correspondence and they became very close friends. To me, this is what, and then they died, isn't this amazing? They died on July 4th, on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. Isn't that just amazing? And to me, that's what politics in America really ought to be about, is that you have people who disagree fiercely over what ought to happen, but they can love each other. They can be friends. All right, the rant's out of my system. Back to Naaman and 2 Kings 5. This is a fascinating story. This is the story of Naaman. He was a mighty man of valor, a military hero. He was great among the Syrians. It says that Naaman was a mighty man, but he was a leper. <laughs> it's always something, isn't it? He was a mighty man, but he was a leper. We could say he is one of the most prominent attorneys in the city of Charlotte, but no one knows his son hasn't spoken to him in three months. She is a great tennis player at the club and hosts wonderful parties at her house, but no one knows she was just diagnosed with ovarian cancer. He's the life of the party. Everybody loves having him around, but no one knows he's babbling depression so severe he didn't get out of bed yesterday. She is a wonderful person. We just love having her around, but what no one knows is that her family is totally out of money and they're in debt, and it's just scary. Or he's just the best neighbor that we've ever had, but even the neighbors don't know that he has a serious drinking problem. He just can't stop always something. I think about Naaman, he's such a great man. I think he thought that his status would be the way to get things fixed. We all do that. A lot of us in this room, we count on our status, our power, who we are, to be able to repair what's wrong with us. I, I do this myself at times. My son says, Dad, you got your people, and my people are you name it. Like, anybody you need, I've got a people for it, right? So if you say, I've got a problem with my eyes, like, oh, call my friend Steve, my eye doctor. He's great. i got a cell number right here, you know. Or my gastroenterologist, like, I've got a cell number. That sounds pleasant, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> and so I've got all my people for everything, and, and I, don't have, I don't have just any doctor. I've got, like, the best doctor. I mean, you don't want just any urologist. You want the best urologist. Like, this, is like, this, is, this is how we are. We've got our connections. We've got our status. We got our client recently, as a matter of fact, I needed a doctor and I didn't have a people in his specialty. So I had to ask around, like, you know, who do you go to? And somebody, this is so interesting, somebody said, here's the perfect guy to go to. I said, why is he perfect? He said, he's accustomed to treating important people. I hoped he was accustomed to treating what's wrong with me. <laughs> important people. We're people of influence. But this does not work for Naaman. It's just so interesting. Naaman, Naaman is a leper. He must have covered it up successfully. Well, you can just let people know that you're a leper because they've shunned you. They would avoid you. So he's a mighty man, but yet he's a leper. He must have kept it up. He, he kept it covered up well enough. But, but then finally the day comes, he, he really wants some help. No one else has been able to help. And there's a little slave girl in the household. She was part of the booty of war. She's supposed to serve him, and she actually did on this day because she said, uh, Mr. Naaman, uh, there's, a, there's a prophet in Israel named Elisha. He can heal people. And Naaman, I guess, was desperate enough to go and try. So what he did was actually pretty interesting. He goes rumbling down to Elisha's house, which we can assume was just something like a shack somewhere in the middle of Samaria. And, uh, and uh, Naaman comes, and he's got his uh, entourage, and he rumbles up with his chariots and his steeds and all of his, 
all of his assistants is very impressive. And he gets outside of Elisha's house and he sends somebody to the door and they knock on the door and say, Naaman, the great man is here. And Elisha doesn't come to the door. He sends a note, right? Like this would be as if somebody knocks on my door one day and somebody says, uh, Dr. Howell, President Obama is in your driveway. And I would say, I'm not coming out. I'll just send him a note. Now, some of you Republicans think, good call. <laughs> so let's change the metaphor. Governor McCrory pulls up in my driveway and somebody comes out, the governor. So of course I would come out for the governor. Of course I would come out for the president. If the president wanted me to come to Washington to lay hands on him, I would happily do such a thing. Why does Elisha do this? And I think he realizes that Naaman's big problem is not leprosy. But it's pridefulness. Pridefulness. That's what he needs to be cured of. It's probably what we need to be cured of. A little note that he sends out says, Go and bathe in the Jordan River seven times. The Jordan River is just this little muddy creek. You don't want to get into it. It's a humble thing that is asked of Naaman. His ego is so large, he has to be humble. This is the key for us. Uh, when I was in seminary, I had a professor, uh, Bob Cushman, taught theology, and I love this phrase. We all memorize it. He said, faith is the conversion of the will through the crumpling of pride. Got to write that. Faith is the conversion of the will through the crumpling of pride. We have to let our pridefulness be crumpled before God can heal us. We need to be humble. Now, that sounds silly to say, go be humble. That, that, that's wrong. It's not go be humble. It's like you can be humble. It is okay. You carry around this albatross, don't you? That like, I'm important and I'm connected. I'm James Howell. I have my people. It's just a lot of pressure always to have to be together and cool and a great man like Naaman. And, and, and what God says is like, you don't, you don't have to do that. <laughs> you don't have to carry that albatross around on your shoulders any longer. You can just put it down. You can be humble. You can say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually weak. I'm actually broken. I'm actually vulnerable. I don't have all the answers. I'm really kind of lost soul. If you can bring yourself to do this, it's so liberating. It's so freeing. Speaking of freedom, we get this thing confused, don't we? We think that freedom is I do whatever I want to do. Somebody says a soldier died so we can be free, and that means we can do whatever we want to do, and that just makes no sense at all to me. And theologically, it's really so wrong. We think that we are free but the fact is, according to the scriptures, this is so interesting, according to the scriptures, you actually aren't free. Even if you've lived every day of your life in the United States of America, the land of the free. The Bible teaches us that you are not free. You are a captive to yourself. You are a captive to self-indulgence. You are a captive to mortality. You are a captive to your own habits. You are, you are addicted to all kinds of things. If I say to you today, don't be materialistic, and you say, well, okay, I'm not going to be materialistic, you won't make it till lunchtime. You're just stuck. We just are stuck being the people that we don't really want to be or the people that we thought we wanted to be. We are not free at all. What the Bible teaches us is that you are a captive. You are in shackles. What God's Spirit does is God's Spirit comes and sets you free. You weren't free before, but the Spirit sets you free. And why does the Spirit set you free? Uh, Palmer, who is our uh, Duke summer intern, preached a wonderful sermon at 8.30 right here in this pulpit. And I'm hereby stealing her material. She quoted that prayer that you read at the beginning of the service where we pray, so interesting, we prayed, free us for joyful obedience. <laughs> free us for joyful You aren't free. You aren't free. The Spirit frees you, and the Spirit doesn't free you so you can do what you want to do from now on. The Spirit frees you so that you can obey Jesus. The Spirit frees you so you can do God's will. The Spirit frees you so that you can be God's servant. The Spirit frees you so that you can be rid of that albatross of importance, and you can actually be humbled and healed. And there is just so much joy and so much, so much life and all of that. Winston Churchill, he always said these funny things, right? And uh, one time a friend was talking about someone in Parliament and said, he's a humble man. And Churchill said, and he has much to be humble about. 
So at the beginning, when I said Naaman was a great man, but I said, what's your, what's yours? And you probably thought, ah, I suspect it's actually a list, though. You have much to be humble about. There's a lot that's broken. There's a lot that's crazy in here. God says, good. That's my opening to heal you. You're freed for joyful obedience. Much as what I did on March the 1st of 1986, Lisa and I came into this very church. We were married right here. And somebody could say, well, boy, that's the day that you lost your freedom. I would say I was not free until that day. I mean, the year before, I could go where I wanted on vacation and I could eat dinner when I wanted to. I could do all that stuff. I could hang out with whoever I wanted to. But then I married Lisa and I don't feel my freedom is infringed upon. I feel like I was finally set free. I was set free to be in commitment. The Spirit sets us free to be in commitment to God. Here's the last thing in the sermon, and uh, this is the hard part, and you may not like to hear it. I've been thinking a lot about pridefulness and how it just is the death of us. I was in a meeting the other day, and I've been in a lot of meetings like this over my 13 years as your pastor and all my career in ministry. There's a group of leaders around the city of Charlotte, educators, business leaders, church people, all kinds of folks. We were talking about what's wrong in the city of Charlotte, and you know, what, what are the problems in education, and what are the problems with the economy, and what, what, how, why is there not social mobility in Charlotte, and why do we have racial tension, and why all these things. We're talking about it, and everybody's given the usual kind of, well, the churches need to work together, and we need to fund these initiatives, and we need to go to the other side of the town and do this, and tutor, and we, all, all the usual stuff that we talked about. And then, then there was this young African-American man who made this blistering speech that would have made your hair curl. Because he stood up and he said, the problem is not in West Charlotte. He said, the problem is with those rich white people. And he went on and on. He said, those rich white people, he said, you tell them in their churches that they have arranged the world to their advantage and to the disadvantage of others. He went on and on and on. Every white person in the room was just kind of trembling. And he kept talking about rich white churches. Everybody kept kind of looking toward me. <laughs> and when he was done, part of me wanted to leap to your defense. I started by saying, I preach to those wicked white people every Sunday. And they're well intended. They really want to do good. They don't understand See, you know what happens to us? I just thought about this. Is that when we hear anything like that, when we hear what's wrong in the world, you know how we react? We react with pridefulness. We hear that there's poverty. We hear that there is not educational equity. We hear whatever it is that we hear, and we react with pride. We say, well, it's their fault, or they should just do this, or you know, whatever it is that we say. We just got our stick going, and it is, a, it is prideful. And I suspect that when Jesus looks down at us and we think about the problems of the world, Jesus does not wish for us to respond pridefully, but rather humbly. You know, Eagle Fizel died. This is really interesting. He died yesterday. And he was in Charlotte three times in recent years, and I got to see him each time that he was here. And I feel really fortunate and blessed by that. One of the times that he was here, I actually had lunch next to him. That's really hard. Like, you're thinking, hey, that's cool. You had lunch with Eli Wiesel. Well, it's hard. What do you talk about? Right? Like, hey, Eli, how was the Holocaust? You know, that's not a good question. And you say, um, hey, I enjoyed reading Night. That's a good book. You know, just anything you say just sounds trivial because he's such a great man. He's such a great man. You know what Eli Wiesel did? This is really important. Eli Wiesel showed us what humanity is capable of. And humanity is capable of terrible things. Humanity is capable of just hurting other people. Humanity is capable of having deep prejudice against people that are different and it mutes into hate. Humanity is capable of awful things. But Eagle Wiesel also showed us what humanity is capable of, and we are capable of doing good. We are capable of doing better. We are capable of changing the world. Eagle Wiesel, after he got out of Auschwitz, he said that his plan has always been to devote his life to one thing only. That is 
to help all of us to look anywhere where there is suffering or injustice or poverty, you name it, whatever is wrong, whatever is not the way God designed things to be, we are to look at that and ask, what can we do to change it? How can we stand up for those who are hurting? What, oh God, are you asking us to do to change the world? Not responding pridefully by blaming everybody. We have influence and we use our influence for ourselves. We seldom say, you have influence, use it for others. This is why God has put us here. Not prideful. Being humbled. Being humbled. Naaman goes down. He's willing to be humbled. And he bathes in that muddy creek that is the Jordan. I love what the text says. The text says that when he came up out of the water, he was healed. And it says he had the flesh of a young child. I gotta love that. He'd had leprosy, but now he has the flesh of a young child. It was a young child that told him where to go, and now Naaman has the flesh of a young child. Jesus, we may recall, said, unless you become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. And as best I can tell, children just aren't prideful, unless they learn it from their parents and become prideful. On their own, children just aren't prideful. And children are really naive about the problems of the world. If any of you have had children, you know exactly what happens. You're driving around with them in the car, and you see a homeless person. They say, Daddy, who's that? And you say, that's a homeless person. They say, why are they homeless? You go, oh, oh, you say whatever you say. And the kids will always say, can they come live at our house? And you always say, oh, no, no, no," whatever you say. (laughs) My children think you can fix these things. And they would be right. God calls us to become like children, to be humble, to be healed. That applies out in the world and applies in our souls. We become, I love what the choir is saying, it's as if we have become strangers to ourselves. But when God's grace heals us, we're no longer strangers to ourselves. We really do become like a child at home. Thanks be to God. Hey, thank you for watching. And uh, we hope you got something out of that. If you have any feedback for us, any response that was helpful to you, we would love to hear that. Please let us know. And everything that we put out is free and we want it to be that way. But if you're able and feel led to, uh, to support the mission of our church or the cost of providing this online content, here's how to do so.